projects here and there. Um, just as a way of introduction, my name is Matthew Randazzo. I am from the Department of Natural Resources. I am the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of Public Lands, Peter Goldmark, who is the Executive the Statewide Elected Official who runs the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and I'm also the uh, Policy Supervisor for Tianway Community Forest. So I am the uh, head person in Olympia for the TNLA. So you'll be seeing a lot of me. If you haven't met me already, I look forward after we do our quick presentation to get to meet you in person. With me here is? Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe Storr. I'm the Deputy Director at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I just want to tell you how great it is to see uh, this turnout and uh, how um, serious, how honored I feel to be part of this this, the state's first community forest. The, uh, the turnout here, I think, demonstrates the uh, responsibilities that we both carry, our agencies carry, to connect with the community, uh, to, to make you all a part of the process. And uh, also just um, excited about the role that this purchase, this management plan, is going to play and the Yakima Basin, with the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan, the relationship there uh, of this, this purchase and the way we manage this land is, is central to success in the broader Yakima Valley. So, um, great to see you here, and it's great to, to uh, hopefully um, hear your thoughts and advice as to how we move forward. Great. And one of the special things about the Tianaway Community Forest is that uh, the community, the folks here in this room, I can see many faces who worked very, very hard to make this land, uh, land purchase and conservation happen. Uh, this is a project that I know for many folks in this room they've worked on for many, many years, conserving the TNLA and conserving the values that brings the local community. And we're hoping that uh, through our two agencies working together, both the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Natural Resources, we can help provide that last step in what has been a long-term community vision to protect one of the most valuable and loved piece of lands in the state of Washington. So why we're here tonight is we're, this is the kind of the kickoff of our community engagement process that will determine the future of how the TNOA is managed. The, the TNOA, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, is roughly 50,000 acres of some of the most highly uh, beloved recreational lands and most valuable conservation lands in the state of Washington. And we are managing it under the Community Forest Trust model, which is the first land management model that the state government of Washington has ever uh, put together that allows the community to drive the vision. Uh, the community, uh, and, that, and when I say the community, I mean everyone who loves the TNOA, has got an opportunity to engage with the state agencies that are working on your behalf to manage this land and give us advice and insight and input on how this land needs to be managed to reflect your values and your goals. So this event tonight is the first step of a very long, very intensive process of figuring out how the, in the future this land will be managed. Now our goal tonight is just to introduce the engagement process, introduce how things are going to work, hopefully answer your questions, and then after we do a very quick overview of uh, tonight's, uh, of the engagement plan, to move out into the crowd, go to various listening stations and be around the room, and speak to you face to face, one on one, and answer your questions and listen to your feedback and kind of get this ball rolling. Uh, the next step going forward will be folks like you, uh, members of the community who love the TNLA, applying to join the advisory committee to help us operate and work through this process to make sure we're getting things right and doing things the way you want it to be done on this piece of land that we're conserving for you. So as you see tonight's agenda, we're going to go a quick little PowerPoint, and I know nothing makes people more excited than state government bureaucrats doing a PowerPoint. So contain your excitement, please. It will be done quickly, hopefully. Uh, and after that, we are going to come talk to you guys one-on-one, -on -one and we'll be listening. Uh, as I said, this is not something where the state government is in the lead, you guys are in the lead, you guys are setting the agenda, setting the tone, and letting us know what you want to learn about it, what you want to hear, and what you want to see on the landscape. So, the first step is let's just get through this PowerPoint so you all can take a deep breath and actually uh, engage with us as human beings. So let's start. So let's start first with the Department of Natural Resources. I'm sure most folks in this room know what DNR is, but the Department of Natural Resources is a state agency that manages roughly 5.6 million acres of land. Uh, its primary goal is to create uh, revenue for our trust beneficiaries, uh, which include uh, the Common School Trust, the School Construction Account, 
Basically, we, we manage land to provide non-tax revenue to support education and other major priorities of the people of Washington. Uh, we also have a uh, large amount of other responsibilities. We are the state's wildfire suppression agency. So uh, in the summer and fall this year, you'll see a lot of DNR employees who have other day jobs out fighting fires to keep your community safe. We also manage 2.6 million acres of the state aquatic lands, and we have a number of uh, 155,000 acres of conservation lands that we manage specifically for conservation. Next slide. My agency is the hunting, fishing, and wildlife watching uh, agency. Those are words that are, are uh, throughout our statutes, our authorizing statutes. Our customers, the people we work with, contrib contribute uh, about four and a half billion dollars a year to the state's economy. Those are estimates that come from uh, federal surveys, federal studies that are, are done periodically. Uh, we manage, as I said, hunting and fishing to sustain um, those kinds of opportunities, recreational and commercial both. We oversee nearly a million acres of public wildlife lands. Uh, we operate 83 fish hatcheries. We, we produce about 150 million fish a year out of those hatcheries. And 700 water access sites. So again, part of our recreational opportunity uh, work. And we have our own law enforcement um, program that, to protect fish and wildlife and public safety. So this project is somewhat innovative. Uh, never in the history of the state of Washington have Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Natural Resources co-managed a land, a landscape as important and as challenging as the Tiana Lake. And so a lot of people, when they first heard that we'd be working together on this, may have thought that might lead to some conflict, uh, including some members of the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. But so far, things are going really well. One of the reasons why is we share a lot of the same uh, vision for how we should manage promoting multiple uses, that means making sure that we're protecting not only if it's, for example, for DNR, if we have trust lands that, we, that produce revenue, we also do everything we can to make sure that the public still has access to it and has recreational opportunities on the landscape, and protecting environmental values and maximizing economic benefits for the community. And both agencies, uh, and though I might hear a joke, a laugh at you in the audience, work really hard to try to engage the community and represent the folks that we work for, i.e. those taxpayers in the state of Washington. So the Community Forest Trust Model is a, another unprecedented new innovation that we're trying out in the TNOA here. The Community Forest Trust is a model that's different from DNR's typical land management model. So at DNR, we, very, we normally have trust lands to manage primarily for revenue. So we have to produce revenue for the trust beneficiaries first and foremost, and other uses we can achieve on that landscape for the folks of Washington, that's great. But our primary goal is to produce revenue. We also have conservation lands, natural resource conservation areas, natural heritage program lands that are managed specifically for conservation use where they don't have any timber harvest or any other revenue producing aspects. The community forest trust model is somewhere in between where we are not expecting to have a heavy, heavy timber harvest specifically for producing revenue, nor are we having no timber harvest whatsoever. It's a land management model where we manage a piece of land uh, based on the feedback we get from the public that is invested in that landscape, and we do some revenue producing activity to pay for the upkeep of that land. So for example, in the Tiana Way, the legislature directed us to make sure we still have active timber harvest and grazing on land as has been traditionally practiced on the Tiana Way, but to do so consistent with the community's vision and with the watershed protection uh, parts of the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. So a, a very, uh, very, very key part of um, the success that we had with the legislature was the collaborative partnership that developed in the Yakima Basin. Uh, we had uh, both people from both parties, rural, urban, uh, $100 million uh, came together, nearly $100 million to purchase this property. That only happened because of the uh, strong relationships, the collaborative nature of the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. Um, this is a picture of the signing of uh, the easement that was uh, granted from DNR to Fish and Wildlife that 
I think it's symbolic, represents that, that collaborative uh, partnership. And as Matthew said, I think we're working very well together as we, as we get out of the blocks on this. That's got to continue. This, this easement uh, was signed the same day as the sales agreement was signed. And what it does is it guarantees this co-management, this co-decision making um, relationship that we have. Uh, so it was a pretty exciting time and, and you can see the smiles on everybody's faces there. You can see Joe on the back left looking absolutely enthused. Um, that's as excited as he ever looks. Uh, and just so everyone knows, I mean, this landscape is so valuable that it was the very first request of Governor Inslee's administration that this landscape and the Acme Basin Integrated Plan be achieved. At the same time, it was the number one priority of Senator Jim Honeyford, the lead of the, of the Senate Republicans' capital budget. So this is a really high-profile bipartisan project, and one of the reasons our two agencies are working together is by combining the expertise and resources both agencies bring to the table, it's the best guarantee the state has that this landscape is managed in a consensus-driven manner with the best possible resources, with the best possible expertise, and all the skills and talents available in land management available in the state government to make sure that this project is done right. There are so many folks around the state who are watching this project to make sure we do it right that uh, I cannot begin to tell you how high priority it is for both agencies that we execute this project in a way and this process in a way that the folks in this room go, go to their legislators, go to their uh, go to the governor and say, no, we don't agree with you guys about everything, but at least when it came to the TNOA community force, you guys did this right. You listened and you had a re operated a real inclusive community-driven process that reflected the values of the people who wanted this land protected and got the job done. So, part of the formula for success is, you guys know, the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan has had extraordinary success in bringing all sorts of very diverse interests together in this, in this region and getting them all on the same page behind a consensus-driven approach to raise the level of water storage in this area for irrigation as well as for uh, in-stream flow and conservation purposes and achieving the multiple, uh, multiple other goals that reflect the values of this community. Because we already are operating in an area where the Yakima Basic Integrated Plan has done a great job of building a collaborative team effort, we feel it's very, very important for us to follow that model and work together collaboratively with the folks who've been helping run the YBIP in this area to make sure we can build off their success, build off the lessons they've learned, and continue to execute their vision for this land and this landscape that has been so popular across the state. I guess I want to add a, a little bit more here, too, uh, in terms of, of the um, role that this uh, piece of land is going to play in the Yakima Basin. It just came over the past, and uh, I used to be heavily involved in, in water management uh, with uh, the Department of Ecology. Yeah, and I was looking at the snowpack at this point in time. Um, I mean, we got serious, serious issues coming if we don't get more snow. Uh, California is in its third year of a drought. Uh, and right now, it's a, it's a little scary. Um, so the Yakima, I think the existing five reservoirs hold about a fifth of the necessary water for irrigation use uh, in any given year. The rest is in the snowpack. If we can't figure out a way to have more uh, efficient use of water and more storage of water for the Yakima Basin, uh, we're going to continue to be challenged if, if uh, climate change uh, reduces that even further, we're going to be in a lot of trouble in this basin. So that was a big driver behind the people involved in the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. And the Tianoi Purchase represents a, a key part of a balance that's attempting to be struck between the conservation of, of water for in-stream flow uses and for, um, for, for other uses, the, the uh, quality of the habitat and land that, that's on the Tianoi. That's, that's part of the balance as they look at, de at developing new water sources new storage facilities, more efficient infrastructure for water management. So you got to remember that there, there's the Tianoe in and of itself and, and all of those uh, interests and purposes we're trying to work with you all on. It plays a significant role though in that broader 
Yakima Basin in terms of uh, being part of uh, the ability to gain support and funding for further water storage and further water supply. So uh, there, there's uh, sort of two levels of, of community here, if you will. Um, there's the, the community immediately around the facility, or the land, I'm sorry, and then there's the larger Yakima Valley, and actually, it's, it's a statewide interest. You wouldn't have received $100 million if you didn't have support from uh, a lot of sectors across the state. So, this year, uh, last year, I keep forgetting it's 2014, uh, in 2013 legislative session, uh, we had a lot of um, direction from the legislature on what parameters we need to stay within to make this landscape, uh, management of this landscape successful. And that's because the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan itself was adopted as state law. So the state law now requires us to follow these principles in the management of the uh, Tianoi Community Forest to ensure that our management of the Tianoi Community Forest allows the $4 billion uh, roughly of an urban correct me if I'm off uh, irrigation projects that are foreseen going forward to raise the availability of water in this area to protect the multi-billion dollar agricultural industry in this region. So the general areas we're supposed to, uh, vision that we're supposed to abide by is protecting and enhancing the water supply and protecting the watershed, maintaining working lands for forestry and domestic livestock grazing while protecting the key watershed functions of the area, maintaining and expanding recreational opportunities where consistent with watershed protection, and that's a question I get all the time, so I'm going to repeat it. Maintaining and expanding, where possible, recreation opportunities well, where consistent with watershed protection. It is our goal not to be reducing the opportunity for the folks in this area to utilize this landscape for recreational purposes. And hopefully, by utilizing our resources, we can actually in increase and upgrade the, the opportunities folks have to use this land for outdoor recreation. Next, we have to conserve and restore the vital habitat of fish and wildlife and support a strong community partnership, consulting with land, consulting with land management with the Yakima Nation, residents, business owners, local government, conservation groups, and others. And so that, all of these vision statements, all these ideas are directly, were directly created by the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan process. We got, it was directly taken from the YBIP, enshrined in law, and given to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Natural Resources as direction on how we're supposed to approach this project while engaging with the community. And as everyone says, I assume there's no one who's never heard of the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. If you haven't, I am deeply sorry because this has been very confusing up to this point. Uh, <laughs> but you can see the extremely broad cross-section of state agencies, federal agencies, local governments, uh, nonprofits, irrigation districts, anything you can imagine, who've all come together for the first time in history and, and work together to make a collaborative vision they can all agree on and work together to achieve. Uh, my boss, Peter Goldmark, who's from Okanagan County, always likes to remind folks that you know where he comes from, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. And so hopefully this, this is for once where we can actually get together and agree on water too. So, you want to take this trip? Well, the, the act um, calls for community engagement in, in a number of ways. Uh, it identifies groups that um, we will be required, and, and we hopefully have done that anyway, but will be required to consult with uh, a wide range of people. And I won't read them all, but you can see up there that the act goes specific towards this consultation uh, responsibility that we have. And obviously, um, a number of folks in this room represent multiple of these groups. You want to take the next one? And that just means we have to talk to you guys. We have to talk to you guys anyway. But the legislature also um, required us to have members from five constituencies on the final advisory committee. And those are from the local community, which, once again, we would obviously have local agricultural interests, land conservation organizations, and then there are three very specific entities that must be represent, represented on the advisory committee. The Yakima Nation, the Kittitas County Board of Commissioners, and the State Department of Ecology. So those three uh, entities have to have a member on the committee. And we have to have a member that represents the other three broader interest groups on the committee. Uh, as I mentioned, all those groups that have already been there, but the legislature, just to make sure, directed us by the state law to ensure that those groups are represented. So the purpose of the community outreach is pretty straightforward. 
we're ensuring that the way we manage your man reflects your priorities. Now, granted, I can pick a random person from this side of the room and a random person from this side of the room, and you might disagree on what to do with this, with a certain campground or a certain snowmobile trail or a stream, but we're talking about the broader consensus community vision. And that's going to be the real rub of the difficulty we have to face, is going through some very controversial, very difficult, very complex issues and trying to sort out what the broad consensus of the community that's invested in TNOA wants to see happen. And that's going to take a lot of help. And not just from uh, folks in this room, but from your neighbors, from your friends, from organizations that are influential. We need the help to try to understand what the consensus is, because that's what we're going to be needing to have to be able to manage the land in accordance with your goals. And so let's get down to the nuts and bolts of what this advisory committee is going to look like. So we're accepting applications as of tonight. We have applications here, and we're going to go into more detail on how you apply. But it's a very simple one page back and front application. It's nothing complicated. There's no uh, multiple choice. It's very simple. And we're going to be accepting applications on February 14th. We'll be sending out press releases. We'll be talking to a local newspaper and radio station, making sure everyone gets the word out. But we're relying also on folks in this room to take it to your local Rotary Club, take it to your church on Sunday, take it to your uh, knitting group. Go anywhere you can, anywhere you think of people who care about the TNOA in its future. Spread the word that we're looking for people in the community to participate with us. And that doesn't mean just members of the advisory committee. The advisory committee is just a group of people we're choosing to help organize the process with us. Every single member of this room can come to any meeting of the community advisory committee or its subcommittees and participate and engage with us and provide feedback and insight. We aren't electing a legislative body to make decisions. We're electing a group of people, we're choosing a group of people to help us run a process. And every member of the public in the state of Washington can engage in this process and help us form this vision. The first meeting we expect to be in March. Um, the legislature, in its infinite sense of humor, has asked us to complete this extremely complicated process by June of next year. So if you are going to apply for this committee, it's going to be a pretty heavy and pretty intense time commitment because we have to get a complicated uh, community engagement process done in roughly over a year, which will be difficult, but we can do it. And lastly, uh, on the meetings, we're not exactly completely sure how many we're going to need to get this done because we haven't started. We expect that minimum once a month for the main committee, and we'll have subcommittees that meet also probably around that basis. But there's no perfect clarity at this time. If you want to be a part of the committee, I'd expect a major time commitment. That's the best we can do at this time for us clarity. Do you want to add this one? Well, we'll also be uh, hiring a um, meeting facilitator. We're, we're going to have some help, and so expect some support and interaction there too. So the way we have this set up is there's going to be a central advisory committee. That's going to be around 15 people, but it might end up being 13, it might end up being 20, depending on the applications we get. We're not trying to decide now because let's say we have 17 people who would be just perfect for it. There's no reason to arbitrarily say two of them can't be on. But we're trying to keep it small enough that it'll be manageable. We've had enough experience with public process, even a 50-person committee, just getting the quorum taken care of might take 30 minutes. So it's good to have a small enough committee that we can work together and build a good team spirit and have clarity. We expect there to also be created issues-focused subcommittees. So for example, and this isn't, uh, I'm not saying what these subcommittees are, we haven't finalized it, but we might have one on outdoor recreation, or one on forestry, or one on grazing. We'll have issues-focused uh, committees, subcommittees, so that even if you're not on the 15-person main advisory committee, if you want to be more involved in the process, and, you have, and you're an expert snowmobiler, or you're a, really, you're a long time hunter in this area, or you've been camping in the TNOA since you were a little kid, you have an opportunity to engage just on the issue that really matters to you. Because not everyone cares about every single little thing. Some folks, I've had people call me, all I care about is that the one place where I pinch my tent every July with my family, that that isn't taken away from me. And they don't care about anything else. And other folks care about every single decision we make. And you have the opportunity to decide what level of engagement's right for you. So the issue focus subcommittees will report to the advisory committee, will process it, try to come up with a consensus and provide feedback to the agency on what the direction is on various issues that you'd like to see for the see us uh, manage the TNOA for. And the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Natural Resources 
We'll make sure we'll take that data in, work with the facilitator to help facilitate the process, but we'll also be checking in with the aqua based integrated plan and those and their work group to make sure we're on the right track and we're staying on the course set by the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan that's not been enshrined in law. So there are going to be multiple avenues for the community to be sure that we're having a transparent and collaborative process. We really want to be clear, we're not hiding the football in any of this. Every single meeting is to be open to the public. There's no question that you're going to ask me that I'm not going to give you an answer to if, as long as we don't have the, as long as I have an answer for you. A lot of you, a lot of folks are going to be asking us questions after we're done with this presentation, and the honest answer is we don't know yet. And we honestly don't know yet. We're still working. This is the first time we've ever done a community forest before, so we're learning as we go along. But this is exciting because the folks in this room have the ability to help set the precedent for how community forest will be managed for the rest of the history of the state of Washington. We're really setting this course here, so we need your help in making sure we get it right the first time. Anything you want to ask that, John? That was enough. Cool. <laughs> Sometimes he sneaks up. So uh, we have an opportunity. You can apply multiple ways. We have uh, paper copies in this room that they will sign up and use. We'll have some at our headquarters at DNR and DFW locally and in Olympia. But you also can sign up online. A uh, very simple uh, URL there that you can plug in and you can fill out your application tonight and we'll get it immediately and you're done. Uh, and we'll have opportunities also through our newsletter. They can sign up for email newsletter. We'll email you this link so you don't have to write it down right now or take a photo of it. Uh, and it's a very simple five minute application. And all we're asking for really is who you are, what groups you belong to, what your interests are, what expertise you bring, and give us a couple references so we know what sort of team player you are and who you work with in the community. Very simple, very straightforward. And after you collect all the applications, the leadership of both of these two agencies are to get together kind of sort it out and figure out what's a good team to get started. But as I said, this isn't a legislative body. Who we pick to be on the advisory committee does not determine the future of the TNOA. This determines who's going to be doing a whole lot of drudgery and office work, <laughs> going to a whole lot of meetings for the next 16 months. And while the rest of you can look at them and go, ooh, I only want to go to that one meeting in July, I have to go to the next 16 months of meetings. And there's also another easy way you can apply. You just go to our DNR website and us in that little arrow in our very cluttered website, you can see the piano lights. Um, and you go right out there, and it has some information for you. Also, have a copy of the application and a link to where you can uh, log in and apply online. And we expect that Fish and Wildlife to also have a, a bridge you know, across to the application. So we're still that's one thing we're still working on. You need a, you need a bridge. A bridge. Okay. <laughs> a link. <laughs> so there are many ways you can participate. You're going to be able to come to the community meetings, all be open to the public. If you want to come participate, just come on down. There's going to be no secrets. You're going to see the press releases in the local newspaper. If you join our email newsletter, you won't miss a single thing. But let's say you don't want to go to the meeting. Let's say you're out of town. There are ways you can provide feedback online. You can uh, take online surveys. We'll have the uh, opportunities for you to just email us, call us, ask questions. Uh, we're really going to try to be as open and responsive as we can and give you as many avenues to get your input as, as we can handle. If you have ideas on other ways we can be open and available for input and discussion, let us know. We're looking for new ways to engage with the public and get a broader consensus. So next, what's going to happen here is we're going to take a minute and kind of reorganize ourselves. We're going to have DNR and DFW staff at a number of listening stations around the room. And these listening stations are going to have opportunities for you to walk up and just talk to us. Because we could do this like a town hall and have people raising hands and everything. But that kind of defeats the entire vision of the community forest, where it's not two guys from Olympia on the stage telling you how we're going to manage that piece of land right outside the window. We want to actually come down and actually chat with you folks, hear what's on your mind, answer questions point blank, have our people get to know us, shake us, shake our hands, and start to build the relationship and teamwork we're going to need to get this project done in the next 16 months. Okay, so, Matthew, excuse me. Before you break into the listening station, sure. I, I have some questions that I'd like the audience as a whole to hear rather than in small groups. Sure. Can everyone hear Jim? Yes. Okay. And, uh, first, I have to apologize for looking like a city slicker in this audience. I worked today and didn't have time to change. My wife, Trudy, and I live in the Lower Valley and have been very committed to Tianway for a long time. Okay. As you know, things in our world don't happen in a vacuum. Yes, sir. And there's a number of us that have been, have been hearing things that are disturbing. Sure. The legislature was struck, legislation was structured to create an advisory committee and also 
in the minds of many, named specific interest groups that Could you step up and use the mic, please? Sure. So if you hand them your mic for a second. Legislation was structured such that it created an advisory committee and also named specific interest groups. Right. Which I can assure you in the minds of people who drafted it was intended to ensure that those interest groups were on the advisory committee. Now, what we're hearing from within your respective organizations is that an intention to disregard that based on the technicality of where the advisory group was committed and where the uh, committee is structured. Is that true? So to answer your question, uh, I, I've worked with Senator Honeyford on this bill. I assume you're referring to Senator Honeyford as first legislative direction, right? Absolutely, sure. Well, I guess I need to qualify that. Uh, Senator Honeyford didn't do that in a vacuum, and he didn't do it without consulting with other people who vote through it. And I mean, there are a number of legislators who were very influential. Representative Warnick, I'd be remiss not to mention her hard work on it. Uh, in the legislation, there's two separate paragraphs. There, it specifically explicitly states members, uh, groups that are supposed to have membership on the committee, and groups that must be consulted. That is our interpretation of legislation. I'll be happy to visit Senator Honeyford. If we are incorrect with that, we will recalibrate. Or you might see legislation to correct that. I don't think that will be necessary. <coughs> As I said, our goal is to, ma is to maintain within the parameters that were directed by the legislation. Because during the course of your remarks, you, you referred to some of these groups as just means we have to talk to us. Consult with them as well. <coughs> I understand. Be very clear, Jim. Sure. You're in charge. Thank you. Be very clear, Jim. If uh, there's a misunderstanding how legislation is to be read, I appreciate you bringing it up and we'll resolve it. There's no, there's no attempt to duck anything. Yeah, I, I, I would say um, maybe a, a little more clearly, we're going to make sure all the interests involved are, are engaged. Now, you know, does that mean, what's that mean in terms of active membership? We need to figure out how many people apply, who, where they're applying from. I mean, we need to look for a balance. But at the end of the day, if we haven't satisfied a lot of interest in this in this basin in terms of how we build that advisory committee, we haven't been successful. So um, don't mean to, to appear to be dancing around that, Jim, but. Um, okay. Um, the next issue of concern is the application, the same one we saw in draft form, or essentially that. I don't know which application you saw in draft form. Uh, I saw the one that the uh, county commissioner had last Friday. Has it been edited since last Friday? It's close. Yes. I, okay. I, 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 think I can give you the application if you, if you want to see what the uh, Well, I, I'll express my concern. Sure. There are a lot of us that have experienced manipulation by government. And I'm not here to accuse anybody of that, but in my mind, that application smacks of creating the ability for you to do that vis-a-vis -vis some of the questions. Like, what is your desired outcome? Now, for my own sake, if I'm there appointed as a representative of an interest group, it isn't my desired outcome that's relevant. It's can I adequately represent the opinions and feelings and concerns of the interest group. That could be the sign up. And to adequately represent. that application, you know, is quite a bit broader than it seems than seems to be necessary and is a cause for concern among a number of people. So, so, so Jim, can I address that for one second? Sure. As someone who helped write the application, it never occurred to me that that would be the interpretation. It was simply, what is your hope for participating in the committee, not your desired outcome for the land management strategy at Tanaway? I thought that application was as straightforward and full and clear as transparent as something could be. If there's being read into, I understand, given the history of some of the land management projects that the state has handled, why there's that concern. But I promise you, that was that wasn't it wasn't by any design that we're creating some application to have some necessitated outcome. Our goal is to make sure we have a balanced committee that's representing the multiple interest groups and multiple interests in the county. And we don't have a desired outcome. I don't have a desired outcome. My desired outcome is only that the folks in this room and Senator Honeyford and Governor Inslee and everyone who's invested in this project feels like we were in a fair, transparent, and responsive process. I personally have no opinion on how the TNOA should be managed besides that. You mentioned that the deadline is February 14th. Uh, 
you've been a long time developing this. The legislation was enacted some months ago. We, we've only yeah. owned land since October 1st. Pardon? We only owned land since October 1st. Yeah, but you knew what your responsibilities were going to be oh. under the enabling legislation when quite some time ago. And there's concerns about the accelerated process because not all of us are that involved and up to the minute. And there's a lot of people aren't going to hear about this probably timely. Um, that's probably sufficient, except it leaves me with one question. You mentioned off-road vehicles in your PowerPoint. Where did that come from? Because I am aware that very consciously provided in the legislation reference to snowmobiling, but it was a deliberate omission on off-road vehicles. So you're suggesting that there, there was, was never any intention to facilitate off-road vehicles in the context of a habitat protection area. No. I, I'm, not, I'm not clear. I followed up. If you chat with me afterwards, I'll address okay. it. There's an error there. I think if you start throwing things like that up right now, you're already saying, like, I think the group needs to decide how this is going to look. Mm -hmm. not the organization that had a plan or a vision. I'm not trying to speak for one organization, sir. I'm just trying to speak in the context of being aware of the process that's involved in the underlying purpose of that land is to afford recreation opportunities, but first and foremost, to serve the habitat protection as an integral part of the Yakima Basin Plan. And so, Jim, I want to thank you for the hard work you did in making this project happen, and I hope that you feel like we get an opportunity to ask your questions. I do want to make sure there's an opportunity for everyone in the room to engage with us, but by all means, come visit. If you're back and looking, come visit me. I'll come over here. If you're over here, I want to make sure we address your concerns, and if Senator Honeyford has any concerns, I'll visit with them first thing.